do with this one. So, shall we get started? Good. Okay, so our second recitation after Labor Day. I saw that 21 people did the readings. That's great, actually. Is there anyone who didn't do the readings here? Reviews? I didn't think so. So more people did the readings than registered, which is a good sign, I guess. <laughs> I guess some people want to register, but they can't. OK. Uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about the readings a little bit also. Uh, I titled this Rethinking Memory System Design. I wanted to actually give you an overview of the paper that you read. I deliver talks related to that. So I'll, we'll probably talk about some of what you read. And hopefully, this will be more of a discussion, because you've already read the paper. Uh, and you can ask questions. But before that, I'll cover a little bit of things that we didn't cover last time. Why do research in computer architecture? Hopefully convince you that it's an exciting field. If you've taken 447, you can probably zone out a little bit. <laughs> but it's always good to think again. And we'll talk about project proposal, timeline, and topics, because you'll need to do that very soon. Uh, so hopefully, you're reading other things in addition to what I assign. And we'll talk about review assignments for next week, which, are, which is related to project proposal. Maybe, maybe this will give you some ideas, too. And then we'll go into the rethinking memory system design. Is that reasonable? Good plan? OK. So why do research in computer architecture? I think hopefully you're here for that purpose, right? But if you're not already excited, I think this is going to be even more exciting times for computer architecture and computer architecture research. And uh, this is a slide that I use in uh, 447. It's actually a really old slide, if you can see that. This is 2005, right? And you're around 1 billion transistors over there. And Moore's Law is, has been the enabling technology for a really long time. And you've, you've probably seen Moore's Law. We're not going to go over this uh, in this class. And this is another look at it, basically. This is what Moore drew in the Electronics Magazine in 1965. Basically, it's a very similar curve, except he didn't have all these years. But it has worked really well, right? Uh, people have actually. Uh, kept up the promise of Moore's law, if you will, somehow. People argue if it's an economic law or a psychological law. I'm not going to go into that argument, but it makes sense. It's both, perhaps, right? It's an economic thing. But it's also psychological, maybe, because you'd like to keep up that to deliver uh, double the components every other year. That was the initial thing, but it may have changed a little bit. But that's OK. It doesn't matter. Uh, OK, so you should probably take a look at that paper if you haven't read it. It's only three pages. But this is actually another way of looking at it. And this, is, this stopped at 2011. But this, this gave us a lot of transistors over the years, uh, which has been a good thing, right? That, that has enabled a lot of integration on chips. So today, we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll soon talk about CPUs and GPUs and maybe FPGA-like structures on chip. That is enabled all because of this. If you didn't have the transistors, none of this will happen, right? Would have happened also. So that's the recommended reading. It's only three pages. And you can read, uh, basically, the code over here. With unit cost falling as the number of components per circuit rises, by 1975, economics may dictate squeezing as many as 65,000 components on a single silicon chip. 65,000 devices. Uh, well, we're already at, I don't know how many billion now, actually. And another quote, which is actually very forward-looking, I think, will it be possible to remove the heat generated by tens of thousands of components in a single silicon chip? And we're actually seeing this today. But I think uh, one, one good exercise to do is, what happens when Moore's law ends? And I think all good things come to an end. I don't want to be the <laughs> doomsday <laughs> uh, predictor, but I think it's going to end at some point, right? How, many, how, how small can you make these transistors in the end, right, if you're, if you're using the CMOS technology? Uh, either, you, either, either it ends or you move to some other technology that enables that growth again. Uh, but once it ends, or once it gets close to ending, I think how you architect systems will be even more important. And we're already seeing this in the memory space, I think. We're not fully seeing it in the processor space. Uh, but basically, when technology scaling ends uh, or becomes more difficult, it always pushes a bigger burden on the higher levels of the stack. Remember the levels of transformation? If something is not scaling at the bottom, you, sol you try to solve the problems at the higher level. And that's a very fundamental rule, I think. That's probably not going to change. So every new beginning is another beginning's end also. <laughs> uh, even if there's a replacement scalable technology, it will require new architectures to take advantage of it. 
So I think this fits really well into the memory domain today, but it's going to happen in processor domain uh, also. Does that make sense? I mean, nothing controversial here, right? Maybe you guys will see the end of Moore's law. <laughs> Maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, so I think architecture is uh, becoming uh, even more important because of this actually, because we're seeing a lot of the scaling issues. And scaling issues are coming from two directions. One is the technology scaling that I mentioned over here. And the other is the data scaling. At the high level, we have so much data today that that's scaling, and we need to somehow scale the systems to keep up with it. How do you do that critically depends on how you architect uh, computing systems. So basically, why do computer architecture research? I'll go through this really quickly. First, we'd like to enable better systems, right? Make computers faster, cheaper, smaller, more rela reliable, dot, dot, dot. And all of these, we want all of these actually today. It's not, it's not like requirements are reducing, it's they're increasing on the system. And this happens by exploiting advanced and changes in underlying technology on circuits. And enabling new applications, again, this is critical, right? If you actually have a new execution model, you can enable potentially new applications. And a lot of the things that we have, we take for granted today, happened because partially we took advantage of all of these transistors, right? Well, I don't want to go back because there's too much animation. But because we actually architected systems such that we could enable these applications. And going forward, thinking about futuristic applications are becoming, are going to become more important, right? I think one important area is health area. Can you actually architect systems for personalized medicine, for example? How, what, it, what, it, what does it take to do that uh, is important. And of course, we need to enable better solutions to existing problems, uh, like the software. We, again, we take granted all of the software that we have, but it, 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 is, it is there because we were able to scale the architectures, right? Uh, in fact, uh, when single core systems stopped scaling as fast as they were scaling in the 90s, this was a big issue for companies like Microsoft, for example, right? Companies that were not able to adapt to that actually fell behind a little bit. I mean, you could argue that some companies fell behind, some companies actually uh, striped ahead. The systems, companies that, that were able to scale their systems without relying on that hardware becoming faster were able to actually do better in a sense, right? If you think about it a little bit. Uh, like, so for example, uh, Microsoft software relied heavily on processors becoming faster, right? Intel becoming faster. Uh, and single thread performance. If the single. Behind, that's, that's my question too. Say it again? When, when did it fall behind? Because it doesn't seem like it fell behind. Oh, this. Uh, I'm not saying a company uh, as a whole fell behind, but this was actually a difficult time for companies that relied on that hardware. In fact, if you look at Microsoft, they're, they're scaling in other ways right now. They're competing with Google, for example, right? That's <laughs> but uh, that reliance of, let's say, uh, the software on, uh, actually, there's a, there's a good paper that I would recommend uh, from, actually, this could be a reading also. <laughs> uh, well, you can write it down. It's called uh, Spending Moore's Dividend. If you search for that, you'll find that that's from Microsoft Research from Jim Lairs. So hopefully that answers some of your questions. <laughs> so I'm going to defer, that, defer to that paper. That paper talks about, actually, let's see, why is this so slow? OK, there, there's a nice uh, picture here, basically. You, you see that this is how the software uh, cycle of innovation in computer industry. Oh, you cannot see it well. OK, sorry. <laughs> so I was doing all that search for nothing, huh? <laughs> I thought I could, you could see my skills in search. <laughs> yeah, but basically this is the picture. Uh, can you see this from the back? I don't like this thing. Let me actually fix this first because I cannot see my uh, displays this way. What I see it what what I see would be what you get hopefully. <laughs> okay, there you go. I see the same thing. Basically, this is. Uh, the cycle of innovation from that paper. So if you look at this, you get increased processor performance. You take it for granted. That enables larger, more featureful software. That enables larger development teams. That enables high-level language and programming abstractions. That makes it easier to program these things. That enables slower programs, or causes slower programs. And that requires increased processor performance. So that was this vicious or virtuous cycle for a long time. And 
companies actually depend on this. Now, if this goes away, which I hope there is a, ah, there is nothing over there. OK. Well, if that goes away, then the question is, how do you actually make it work, right? So this is actually a very good, uh, very good overview paper uh, that I would definitely recommend everyone to read. So hopefully that will answer some of your questions too. It has a scaling trends also. And okay. Okay. Now we have it here. Yeah. Basically, overcoming other challenges that we face is uh, like the Moore's uh, Moore's law scaling problem uh, is another reason to do computer architecture research. But I think today is actually a very exciting time to study computer architecture. I truly believe in this. Uh, because we're really in a large paradigm shift today. That multi-core, shift to multi-core, that end of single core, actually caused that paradigm shift. Because uh, I mean, you didn't live through those days, but during the 1990s, if you look at computer architecture, it was basically single processor. And how do you actually improve that single processor really well? That has basically changed. Today, if you look at uh, conferences, the research, as well as the industry, it's very, very, uh, there, there's no single dominant paradigm, right? People are talking about heterogeneous systems, people are talking about GPUs, people are talking about accelerators, but there's no dominant paradigm if you look at it. We're at that, that was not the case in the 1990s. That was not the case for a long time, actually, 1980s. So it's good to have that historical perspective. So think, think from this perspective. So we're still in that paradigm shift, I think. Uh, there are many different potential system designs possible. And there are many difficult problems that are motivating the shift and caused by the shift. For example, maybe we'll have a, a lecture on multi-core later on. Uh, we'll go into this a little bit more. But what caused multi-core is a good question also, right? I believe it's the complexity of the design, actually. It's complexity of scaling a single threaded processor to much higher performance levels, which requires a lot of complexity and in turn requires power and energy uh, uh, that caused the uh, move to multi-core. Soon there will be difficulties in technology scaling. The paper that I've assigned to you on uh, memory scaling uh, actually talked about one of the issues, and we'll go into that a little bit more today. And the memory uh, is not scaling very well. Reliability issues are popping up everywhere, as you can see with the row hammer problem, right? Uh, and programmability issues caused by the multi-core. One of the good things about having single core is single threaded architectures that keep growing faster is you don't need to deal with the programming issue, right? Programming single thread programs is also already hard. You get bugs whenever you write single thread programs. But with multi thread programs, it becomes even worse. And also, there's huge hunger for data and new data intensive applications. That are, these are actually motivating other shifts, in my opinion, right now. One of it being uh, doing more in memory, on the memory side, as you can see from the paper uh, that you read. So I think all of these, there, there are no clear, definitive answers to these problems. It's, in the past, there was one answer. Design better superscalar out of order processors, which you're actually studying in the first part of the lectures, right? So hopefully you're attending the lectures. The first half of the course is really about single core processors. Some of it will be reviewed, but hopefully from a dis different perspective. Uh, but that is changing today. There, uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how all of these evolve, how we solve all of the problems going forward. But that's, why, that's exactly why it's an exciting time to study all of these problems. Uh, and the other common thing in, in these problems is actually, if you look at everything over here, they affect the entire system stack, right? Uh, all, all parts of the computing stack. Uh, so for example, some issues coming up, uh, the Rohheimer problem, we'll give you an example, that actually threatens the security uh, uh, principles that, uh, uh, because that actually causes uh, problems with the isolation, right? Basically, now you can circumvent memory isolation as a result, someone can take over the system. And I'll actually talk about this in a little bit. Basically, some little, seemingly little reliability issue over here is actually causing the entire system to become problematic. Similarly, power issue, right? If, if, if the power is a big problem, how, where do you solve the problem becomes important. So it's good to think across the stack when you actually try to solve these systems. That's why you see actually systems becoming more integrated also across the stack. Some companies that can do, do it really well are be, being more successful potentially, right? That are integrating across the stack. OK, so there are many do, new demands from the top coming, like the data intensive applications. There are many new issues at the bottom. And there are fast changing demands and personalities of users also. I believe users have evolved also. I think today's users are a lot more impatient than users in 1960s or 1950s, right? 
or they take things a lot more granted, right? Whereas if you were debugging that e uh, ENIAC computer <laughs> in 1950s, then you would have a problem if you were not patient. <laughs> Does that make sense? So I think all of these actually have, are changing the ecosystem significantly. Okay. Well, this is like, I think that was clear. Uh, basically, both the software and humanities trends and technologies and their issues uh, and the resulting requirements and uh, constraints are changing. They're, they're all very different. And every component and its interfaces, as well as entire system designs, are being re-examined today. And when you think about your project, think about it this way also. Basically, if you look at today, uh, even, the, even the interfaces that we considered very uh, uh, granted, like the memory interface, the DDR interface, for a long time, right? Even that is changing right now. The, processing in memory works that you're going to read actually. Hybrid memory cube interface is a very totally different interface. It's a packet-based interface to memory, which was unimaginable 10 years ago. Right? Uh, HBM interface, it's still DDR-ish. HBM is high bandwidth memory, but it's, it's basically, again, it has a 3D stack logic layer uh, that's already being adopted by NVIDIA and uh, AMD uh, in their GPUs. So, <laughs> so it's, it's already happening. Uh, you, you're adopting it too? <laughs> You worked on it. There you go. So there's, <laughs> there's evidence that it's <laughs> happening. <laughs> so I can use you as the evidence now. <laughs> Citation. <laughs> okay. But basically, uh, interface across everywhere is changing. The heterogeneous architecture interface is changing. Like people are proposing heterogeneous system architecture, right? That's uh, HSA. Uh, and interfaces to memory is also going to change if you have persistence in memory, and we'll talk about that. And you, you read part of, part of the research problems and opportunities paper talked about the persistent memory interface. I believe the interfaces to the GPUs will change significantly also. Today, maybe there are devices, but maybe in the future there will be more first-class computing engines, right? And they will execute the program, and maybe that master-slave relationship will change significantly. A lot of things will become equals in the system, maybe. Maybe all of these will be become equals, and everything will be an accelerator in the end. Who knows, right? That's, that's all up for grabs at this point, which was not the case, again, 20 years ago. And definitely, ten, ten, even 10 years ago. Okay, this may be my last slide, but uh, basically, I think uh, you can actually revolutionize the way computers are built if you understand both the hardware and the software across the stack uh, and change each accordingly. Uh, I don't think you'll have a point solution anymore. Point solutions are good. They improve the technology, and they're good research in the end, but if you really want to revolutionize uh, uh, the, c the, computer, uh, the computing uh, stack, then you'll actually need to change both of them at the same time. I, I really believe in this, but uh, we'll see. Maybe there's some technology that comes up that will change everything, right? We don't know that. So I think you can invent new paradigms for computation, communication, and storage. Uh, and I, I recommend actually this book. I did recommend it in 447. Who read it in 447? No one? Maybe I should buy it for people. <laughs> but even if you buy it, <laughs> you may not read it, right? This is a hard book to read. It's not easy, actually. Uh, has anyone read this book? I think there was one person last year. No? Do people read books anymore? <laughs> Does, is there a Kindle edition for this? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> there might be. But basically, this is a seminal book, actually, in uh, philosophy of science. It talks about the structure of scientific revolutions. It examines a lot of the revolutions that happened in the 1700s, for example, Galileo's re revolution. But basically, uh, I'll, I'll take away a few things over here. You can read the paper for a lot of examples. It basically breaks science into three uh, stages. One is pre-paradigm science, where there's no clear consensus in the field. Everybody's arguing what should be the dominant paradigm. Uh, and there's normal science. There's a dominant theory used to explain or improve things. This is actually the paradigm, basically. There's, you can think of it as a single core paradigm. It's a dominant theory, as well as, uh, as much as theory can be in engineering, uh, to improve things. You improve the single core paradigm, right? And exceptions are considered anomalies. And exactly, that, that, that's, what, uh, that's what exactly parallel computers were 20 years ago. People were working on high performance computing systems, very much GPU like systems, SIMD like systems. But they were kind of on the fringes, right, in a sense, because uh, single thread computing was the dominant paradigm at the time. Today, it's very different, right? If you're working on high performance computing, well, GPUs are an enabler of high performance computing today. They're almost at equal footing with single core uh, systems today. So basically, there's no clear consensus in the field as I see it today. 
And revolutionary science is basically uh, the period where underlying assumptions are re-examined. Basically, you see that uh, this dominant theory is not actually uh, good anymore, or there, there are a lot of exceptions. There are so many exceptions that the theory is being shaken. Now you actually uh, question all of the underlying assumptions. Do we build systems like this, or should we build systems in some other way? And that's how the revolution actually happens, according to Kuhn. And I think we're actually in this period, at this point, we're re-examining a lot of the assumptions that we've made uh, for a long time. And one example of this is, for example, how do you design the memory controller? Very simple thing, right? The assumption was exploit robo for locality. Now, that needs to be re-examined, right? And we've been re-examining that for almost a decade now. Okay, and that's the guy, Thomas Kuhn. <laughs> it's a very good paper, a very, very good book. <laughs> but you have to have the stamina to read it. <laughs> It's not an easy read. Okay. okay. Well, there's a Kindle edition, apparently. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> you'll, ha you'll have to find and let me know. Okay. Any questions? Do you guys agree, disagree? Architecture is not important, do you think? <laughs> well, because you will see, actually, there, there will be people who will say this is not important, right? MIPS R2000. Why do, we, why do we need something other than MIPS R2000? Well, it's clear that way that's, that's been proven wrong, right? Why do we need something better than GPUs today? Well, even if you don't see the applications in the future, if you enable the systems, applications will come. That's, all, that's actually really important to think about uh, in systems. You may not be able to see why exactly, for example, in-memory computing could be used. I think I see it clearly, but <laughs> you will see it clearly too, hopefully. But you may not be able to see it, but if you enable it, someone will take advantage of it, assuming it's an important uh, problem, right? that you're solving. And the bandwidth problem is important. Similarly, if you enable, for example, more general purpose cap uh, computing capability in a GPU, someone will take advantage of it. And that's, that's always been the case. Why do you integrate the floating point unit on chip? Well, that has been very successful, right? OK. OK. No questions? Well, we should jump into the project proposal. I want, yeah. Well, I think I'm not. I'm not suggesting the sec, uh, the first thing that you said. I think if you have a good use case, and if you actually drive uh, the research using that use case, that's also good. But sometimes you may not be able to see all the use cases, right? You just do a fundamental basic research. Uh, let's say improve, I don't know, multi-core performance with some heterogeneity, heterogeneous architectures, and some application will take advantage of it. Right. So I think it it can be done both ways. Like I see a use case, for example, one thing I mentioned is bioinformatics, for example. If you, that's a great use case. If you do genome sequence analysis and if you design a system for it really well, I think that can enable some bigger thing in that domain. <laughs> okay, so you're ready to talk about project proposal? Okay, let's talk about this uh, and then we'll go back to memory. But as I said earlier, this is uh, your chance to explore in depth a computer architecture topic that interests you and hopefully publish your innovation at Top Architecture Conference. And I already said this. We'll have project topics handout. Uh, Nandita has them. Oh, OK, I have them apparently. I'll give them to you later uh, at the end of the class. Make sure you take these. I want to keep these confidential. I'm not going to put them online because there are a lot of ideas here, actually. Uh, you'll get exposed to them. You can pick them. And I will definitely. Uh, uh, recommend that you pick something from this or related to this uh, if you want to get a lot of support. But if you have some other ideas, we should definitely talk about that too, and we will talk about that. Okay, well actually we have, this is just an old slide. We have the dates, there you go. <laughs> well, it's true, exact date will be announced and it's being announced now. <laughs> so it's still not wrong. <laughs> So this is basically what we have for the project timeline. Uh, we have an additional step pre-proposal that's due September 15th, which is next week. And this is basically an email telling me and Nandita who are the group members or proposed group members and proposed topic. It doesn't need to be a proposal in that topic, but here's the direction that we're expecting to examine. Is that reasonable? A week? A week is pretty quick, but this is to get you thinking quickly. Because that's how you can actually get into the research quickly. Uh, and then uh, we want the proposal on September 25th, so that's actually three weeks from now, kind of. 
Uh, and that's the full proposal. And you should look at the uh, project handout uh, for what we expect in the proposal. And then we have a milestone one plus literature review. Basically, uh, you will need to do this for your project anyway, who has done. And I'll, I'll give you an overview of what the pro proposal would look like. And then we have a milestone two. By milestone two, hopefully you'll have made a lot of progress in your research. Basically, well, the expectation over here is you'll have a lot of good results. Well, good is, <laughs> good doesn't mean that it proves your hypothesis or uh, it may be actually something new that you figured out, right? It, does, it, it means you'll have a lot of results, <laughs> reliable results. And then the, we'll have report, talk, and poster, and that's to be determined. Is this a good timeline for everyone? Yeah? Yes. Uh, f so we, uh, we'll, we'll need to figure out exactly how to do that. I would like you guys to present, actually, uh, the papers that you reviewed to the entire class. So ho hopefully the answer is yes. But we may need to actually do it. I'm asking not the material itself, the tools for doing that. That might be even more useful for us later on to research our type of work. Oh, uh, what for doing that? The uh, for, for us doing research our type of work. So not only taking the material, uh -huh. Oh, tools of doing a literature review. Yeah, we can discuss that. We can we can have a session for the tools. Yeah, we, we'll we'll have we'll still have time. So October 13. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a short uh, uh, lecture on how to do the literature review. Also, I can we can we can actually expand on that when we get to that. Okay. Okay, but the intent is actually you'll present. Uh, these are all presentations, and uh, the only report. Well, the only report that you need is the proposal and the report. This is two to three pages, and this is like a paper, full paper. OK? OK. So what is the goal of the research project? And you should actually take a look at this thing. Maybe I'll go right now, if it works. Something is happening. Yeah, so actually, project guidelines are posted. All of the dates are over here. Yeah. You can look at the project guidelines. This talks about all of these things, pre-proposal advice, proposal, OK? OK, I'm not going to talk about that. But I'm going to talk about uh, what is the goal of the research project, or any research in general. As we've discussed, it's developing new insight, right? So it's nothing different here. Hopefully developing new insight. That's our goal. Uh, basically, this comes from solving a problem in a new way, or evaluating or analyzing systems and ideas. And I'll break it into two types. I'm not going to belabor the two types that much, but one type could be you can develop new ideas to solve an important problem based on your reading. Like hopefully you're actually reading. I actually went over some of the reviews that you guys have done. Some of you have ideas on improving things. If you expand some of those, they could be project proposals. Uh, and after developing these ideas, you can rigorously evaluate the benefits and limitations of the ideas, right? This is one type of proposal that you can do. Like, oh, I have this idea. Maybe it's not fully clear yet, but you'll develop it. Right. The second type is maybe you don't have an idea at this point, but you have a system in mind. You have a problem in mind. You should definitely have a problem, regardless of whether or not you have an idea to solve the problem. Basically, you, you, you propose to derive insight from rigorous analysis or understanding of existing systems or previously provided ideas. Basically, let's say you want to characterize, I don't know, retention time in DRAM. Right? You don't have an idea of how to solve the problem, but you have this infrastructure where you would like to characterize the retention time and figure out what are the characteristics of uh, different cells in terms of retention time. And maybe after examining that, propose uh, new solutions based on the, that new observations that you make. Right? So this could be a proposal also, actually. Uh, so you could, for example, say, I'm going to look into uh, I don't know new heterogeneous memory designs. I don't know what to do over there exactly yet, but I'll look at maybe DRAM. Uh, different kinds of DRAM and how to combine them together and how to take advantage of that uh, uh, in, in, at the operating system level. I don't know, I'm just making up project topics right now, but that's a good topic, definitely, like hybrid memory systems, right? How to do ma data management in a hybrid memory system. And perhaps you could have an application driving that, potentially. That could be pretty interesting. Okay, so uh, I think what I want is the problem and the ideas need to be concrete, basically. The problem definitely needs to be concrete, but also what you are going to do about it needs to be concrete, whether or not you choose uh, the first one or the second one. And they need to be very clear, needless to say. So let's take a look at a, a, an outline uh, of a project proposal. 
basically, the first step is really, what is the problem you're trying to solve in this proposal? That's, that's always the first thing that should be, right? The problem. Uh, define very clearly, explain why it's important. Uh, and novelty uh, is important also. This is where the literature review kind of comes in, right? Why has previous research not solved this problem? What are its shortcomings, right? And hopefully some, someone looked at the problem in some way. If you found a new problem, that's a, that's a good thing, but that may not always be the case, right? Actually, usually finding a new problem is difficult. Someone actually looked at something related to this problem, right? That's why, in a sense, all research can be considered incremental. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing, right? That's, uh, basically, here where you can, develop, uh, here you can actually develop your literature survey this way. Basically, you have a good problem, you examine what, has, what have others done, and you figure out all the relevant works, and describe why they're, where, where they fall short. This is why critical reading helps a lot, right? You actually read a paper, you critically evaluate it, and you say, oh, this is where it falls short. There you can actually so try a new solution, uh, uh, figure out new solutions to the problem. So this will eventually be your literature survey, basically. Think about it that, uh, from that perspective. And next, what is your initial idea or insight? What new solution are you proposing to the problem? And if you have an idea, this is going to be hopefully fun and easy to describe. Uh, why does it make sense? How does it, or how could it solve the problem better, right? At least at the qualitative level. So we'd like to see that in the proposal. And hypothesis, what is the main hypothesis you will test based on this idea? So think, think about formulating your proposal as one or more hypotheses, right? And after that comes, how do you actually evaluate that hypothesis, right? How will you test it? Uh, are you gonna use a simulator? If you know what it could be, uh, uh, what kind of simulator, what kind of model will you use? What are the initial experiments you're going to do? These are important. And also, like, later, it's a plan, basically. Describe the steps you will take. So it's always good to think about it and plan it. Now, this is, this is definitely a good structure. Eventually, you may actually deviate from the plan based on what you find, but that's okay. It's good to plan it out a little bit, at least. What will you accomplish? At least, as you set goals for yourself. Yes? Well, uh, hopefully if you choose the right project, you won't have to build a simulator. <laughs> so think about it that way also. I would recommend not building your own simulator from scratch for this course. There are a lot of simulators out there. If you choose the right project, you can actually take advantage of the simulator. You'll need to understand the simulator. That's actually critical. If you don't understand the simulator, you can generate all kinds of garbage. And we can talk about that too in a separate. <laughs> Thing, but and that will take time. But I would I would definitely recommend not building your own simulator. No, I won't. <laughs> I may give, I may be able to give you the simulator if it's uh, among these projects. There are actually some simulators. There are some links uh, from the uh, course website. You can take a look. But yes, we will definitely guide you in terms of what simulators could be useful, and we'll be able to do that more easily if the simulators are actually being used at CMU. So that's why I would recommend picking some project from here. And again, we're talking about simulators, but not, it doesn't, not everything has to be done in simulation, right? Maybe, maybe there's a project that uses some FPGA-based infrastructure, right? That's, that's also fine. If you come up with a project that doesn't require any of that, maybe there is some analytical modeling, that could be interesting also, yeah. So the evaluation method doesn't need to be just simulation. But if you are going with simulation, then I would definitely recommend not building it. That's a really good experience, by the way. If you're going to do research long term uh, in architecture, building your own simulator is a very humbling and nice experience, as long as you do it well. <laughs> so I would, I would recommend that, but not within the time frame of two to three months. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, discuss the milestone goals. What will you present? Well, we don't have a third milestone, but what will you present in the first, second milestones? Uh, what is your moonshot if you're actually really successful? <laughs> what is your goal? And I think all projects can be and should be described in this fashion. Basically, it's not that hard to distill things. And this is easy to read also. And actually, eventually, if you write proposals within a company or in academia, you will see this sort of structure appreciated by people, as long as it's clearly uh, delineated like this. The second type is actually very similar. You still need to explain the problem very well. Uh, how has previous research evaluated this problem? What are its shortcomings? Again, you should talk about the novelty. And what are you going to do, basically? The here, again, you don't have an idea, perhaps, but you want to examine a phenomenon. And I'll take the example of retention time, for example. I'm going to examine the retention time, or row hammer phenomenon, let's say. 
I'm going to take the rope hammer phenomenon and look at its effects in modern chips if you do use ECC or if you don't use ECC, things like that, right? You can, so there, it's not an idea, in a sense. It's not an idea that advances the state of the art, perhaps. It's, it's more of an evaluation analysis of an existing problem, right? But you should still talk about how you will evaluate this, right? What experimental infrastructure uh, do you, will you build or will you actually use? And again, you, you can still have hypothesis, and you can still talk about your methodology. Well, you should still talk about your methodology. So th these two types actually differ very little, in my opinion. The main difference is you have a, whether you have an idea, concrete idea, or not. Okay? Is this clear? Okay. So this is actually very similar to one thing I like, which is Heilmeier Catechism. Has anyone heard of this? Has anyone heard of George Heilmeier? He actually uh, did a lot of work uh, in inventing LCDs. Like, uh, he, he was an engineer. I think he passed away last year. But he was also the director of DARPA for a, for a long time, in 1970s, late 1970s. So he actually funded a lot of research that, that hopefully did a lot of good. <laughs> but basically, this was, uh, I, I, I'm not sure when exactly he developed it, but uh, this was the thing that he would present uh, to someone uh, who wanted money from him. <laughs> At least that's how I like to think about it. <laughs> Basically, what are you trying to do? Right? That's the first thing. What is your goal? Uh, what is the problem? What is your problem? Right? What is the problem you're solving? Ar articulate your obje objectives without uh, no jargon. And that's actually good, because if you're, if, you're, if you're funding some research, you should probably understand it without a lot of jargon. How is it done today? What are the limits of current practice? What's new in your approach, and why do you think it'll be successful? Who cares? Right? That's hopefully someone cares. If you're successful, what difference will it make? What are the risks and payoff? How much will it cost? How long will it take? What are the midterm and final exams to check for success? So th this was basically his catechism, his set of questions that everyone should answer if they want money from DARPA, let's say. Uh, and this is another version of that, actually. This is a more concise version. What is the problem? Why is it hard? How is it solved today? What is the new technical idea? Why can we succeed now? And what is the impact if it's successful? And of, cor of course, there's some plan. I can talk, you, can, you can read more about this. It's kind of cool. And people write proposals this way also. And there's also more uh, on research writing and reviews. Uh, I think, oh, I didn't have you read this this, this time. Has anyone read this, you and your research? OK, good. Yeah, this is definitely something I would recommend to everyone. This is uh, Richard Hamming's uh, talk uh, at Bell Labs talking about how to do research, basically, and his experience on how to do research. It's a lot of great advice in there, in general on doing research. Not, a, not computer architecture, but in general. Uh, and I would definitely recommend that. And I don't think I'm going to sign a paper. Hopefully. So you should read it on your own. And I think I've already given some of these references over here. So hopefully this should be useful. And Nandita will put these up. OK. So where do you get the project topics and ideas from? Well, this hopefully you'll pick up, maybe mid-lecture. Uh, assigned readings are a good source, and recent conference proceedings are also a good source, and maybe other things over here. It doesn't need to be these conferences only. Any questions? Okay. Am I going too fast? Too boring? Let's get into memory, <laughs> you're saying. Okay. Before we get into memory, I'll talk about the U assignments. And those, the three people who've done, well, basically, first of all, they're due again next Tuesday. 3 p.m., same thing happens. Has anyone started discussing ideas on Piazza? I didn't see anything. You don't like Piazza? That's not a good form. I think this would be good, if you, especially if you want to pitch a topic and you want partners, right? And I do want people to partner. <laughs> I don't want to have 21 projects in the end. <laughs> You'll learn a lot more if you actually partner, I think. Uh, but this, this is something I will definitely encourage. Uh, but uh, so those of you who've done this review, I guess, are happy now because you have one less review to do. <laughs> I think three people did that review, which was optional. <laughs> but uh, this is the paper uh, that is required. Well, we have, I think, four papers that are required this time. Uh, and there's a related reading, too. So I would recommend the related readings, especially if you're interested in the idea. Uh, 
And the second paper that's required, uh, I wanted to actually diversify a little bit. Uh, that's about GPUs. It's a little bit out. Uh, it's a little bit dated now, but it's it kind of covers the landscape a little uh, nicely. It's this paper by NVIDIA, GPUs and the Future of Parallel Computing. And their use required. It's a short, relatively short paper uh, in short format. It's not 37 pages for sure. <laughs> yeah. But, and there's back, uh, background reading also if you want to learn more. This is an older paper, the GPU computing era. And there's a related reading that's relatively new from AMD uh, on heterogeneous computing. And if you want to do a project in this area, I would definitely recommend reading some of these. The third paper is actually a more philosophical thing. This is really short. It's by uh, Jeff Ullman, who is a professor at Stanford. I guess Professor Emeritus right now. But I think it's, it's good to read papers like this also, because uh, I actually believe in <laughs> the, the question over here. Uh, basically, experiments as research validation, have we gone too far? He talks about, well, you'll read the paper and uh, hopefully express your opinions, but he talks about, have we really gone too far in research in requiring lots of experimentation uh, before we actually believe in an idea? He's basically asking that question. And of course, it's not a scientific paper. It's more an opinion piece. And, but I, uh, it's, it's good to read and think about this, this point. And it's always good to have that perspective. So if you, he, he has actually some examples here uh, let's say you, you, it, it was uh, 20 years ago, you actually wanted to publish a paper. Did you really need that much experimentation to prove that your idea is worthwhile publishing or your idea is worthwhile actually implementing? That's, that's the question he's asking. For example, could we have published the caching paper today? If uh, today, if you, if you look at the community, there's a lot of push for requiring a lot of experiments to actually validate an idea. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think doing too much of that is not good. You, you actually need, you just need to have enough experimentation to prove a point and educating the community to actually buy this is important. Otherwise, we can actually limit our own progress because some big ideas are actually difficult to evaluate in general. So if you actually have a new computing paradigm, how do you actually evaluate it perfectly, right? There's no perfect evaluation in a sense. Even if you actually design the entire system and do everything, somebody can say, oh, this compiler is not optimized, right? If you're actually too critical, then you can actually uh, make progress slow in scientific research. And I think this, uh, uh, that's why I'm, I'm assigning this paper. So it's good to think about it from that perspective. There's also a related reading, which is also in the same issue uh, from another professor at Harvard, basically. Uh, he's talking about theory more. Theory without experiments, have we gone too far? <laughs> so he's basically, talk, uh, he's from the theory community and he's talking about the th theory. So it may not be as applicable to what we do. This is more applicable to computer architecture and systems, but it's good to read this one also. So there's always a balance in the end. And striking that balance for the fastest progress possible is really important. If you're extremely critical, if you actually reject everything, you disable progress. If you accept everything, now you have actually no basis for what is good and what is bad, right? So there, that, that, uh, finding the appropriate balance between that uh, between the right level of experimentation and right level of insight is really important. Okay, and the fourth paper is Nandita's paper, so since she's a TA, she dictates that you read this paper. No, she doesn't do that, I, I did it, I picked it. But it's related to GPUs, so uh, I want to focus the second set of readings more towards GPUs, plus some memory also. So hopefully this will give you some ideas uh, in GPUs. And I picked this paper because now we can talk to Nandita about it. Uh, and there are some research topics over here that are related to GPUs that she can help with also. Okay, do you want more papers? No. Well, this is actually not that bad because this paper is just two pages. You can actually read it after class. It won't take much time. And there's also a fifth paper that's optional, but which may become required on uh, flash memory. Uh, we'll talk about flash memory, so I, you may want to read that. And it talks about a phenomenon that's actually common to all memory, which is the read disturb errors, right? You, you read it in DRAM, the row hammer problem. If you, uh, well, we'll talk about it also. If you keep activating a row, another row gets disturbed. Well, that happens in flash memory too. And well, that happens in hard disks also. <laughs> so it's very fundamental when some technology scales down to smaller nodes. Uh, these issues start popping up. 
and knowing the solutions uh, in other domains would be really interesting. And there's actually, flash memory is a really interesting area. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the criticisms, uh, which I agree with actually, of the paper uh, that you read, uh, the research problems and opportunities in memory systems, uh, many of you didn't think that that flash memory section fit in very well. And I agree that it doesn't fit in very well because it's not integrated very well into the entire piece. But I actually think flash memory is, uh, could be a really good component of the entire main memory system, and people are actually trying to do that. If you want to have a terabytes, terabytes, and terabytes, or maybe petabytes of memory system, maybe you use flash memory as an extension of your DRAM, right? And then allocate the data appropriately, or manage the data appropriately between DRAM and flash memory. That's why I think it's not only storage, in my opinion, but also you could use that as extended memory. Okay, so it's, it's good to understand. And, and the second thing about flash memory is there's very little public information on the algorithms used in the flash memory controllers, at least the state-of-the-art algorithms used in the flash memory controllers. And this paper is uh, one of the recent ones. So we were actually lucky to have collaborators that enabled a lot of that research. Uh, you, you'll find that flash memory is very much based on patents, and you don't know what's going on, in a sense. So, so it's, it's, a, it's an area that's difficult to do research in. Any questions? But that's optional. So if you do it, hopefully next week, or some week, you'll be less busy. OK. Uh, what time is it? 8.17. Does anyone need a break? Or four minutes. Four minutes? OK, four minutes. <laughs> so 8.21, we can be back. Or 8.22 now. <laughs> I think so. OK, let's get started. So if you haven't taken a handout, take it. But it seems like everybody has. There's only one left for me. OK, so let's now jump into uh, rethinking memory system design. This actually, the, the paper you read is based on the talk that I gave. And the structure has been preserved for a while. So I'll actually talk about what you read. And hopefully, you'll uh, ask questions in the meantime. And because you, you've now read you have hopefully have enough background on what I'm going to talk about. Basically, uh, the, the paper you read focused on the main memory system. And it's, a, it's really a critical component of all computing systems that, you have, that we have today. Regardless of whatever system you're designing, you need to have some sort of working storage, right? Main memory is really the working storage. And this system must really scale in many, many dimensions, in size, technology, efficiency, cost, and algorithms that we use to manage it to maintain the performance growth and technology scaling benefits that we've been used to for a long time. And I mean, I've written that, uh, that paper with what my PhD student, Lavanya, uh, to talk about the issues that we face in scaling the system. Right? And it, you will see, actually, the paper that you're going to read from NVIDIA talks about the system a lot, memory efficiency and memory bandwidth. Uh, they have a good section on that, talking about how data movement is a lot more expensive uh, than computation. Actually, there's a good slide. I, I don't know, remember the exact numbers, but if you, a, a read, a data read from DRAM takes uh, about 16 to 20 nanojoules, uh, whereas a floating point computation is really on the order of picojoules. So, right, so there's a huge orders or, and orders of magnitude difference uh, in computation and communication costs. So that's why this system is the scaling limiter today. Uh, this is another view uh, of the uh, memory system, and it's a shared resource view. And this is a cartoon, but this is actually true in most systems that we design today. If you look at the systems, the red parts are dedicated to computation, and they're the minority. <laughs> they're actually small. Everything else in the system is dedicated to data movement and storage. Interconnects, caches, more caches, memory controllers, more caches, or shared memory, and storage, right? Basically, we're designing all of these systems, and most of it is really dedicated to moving and storing data. And most of it is shared across these different cores. I mean, think about a heterogeneous system also. Again, uh, most of that, like this thing, is uh, memory system is shared across many accelerators over here, actually. Uh, so this is always good to keep in mind. It's really a big shared resource. It's the biggest shared resource we have. And even if you look at this red parts, it's not just computation, right? A lot of the things that we have in there L1 caches, registers, they're all related to memory, storing and moving data. Right. OK, so state of the main memory system, if you read the paper, 
basically there are some recent technology architecture and application trends that lead to some new requirements and that exacerbate some old requirements. And if you've taken 447, if you've taken computer architecture, you know that actually we've always demanded a lot from the memory system, right? We want zero cost, uh, zero latency, infinite bandwidth, and I'm forgetting something, infinite capacity, right? And we want more today though because we are facing scalability issues. So given these, the, the new trends, DRAM and new memory, uh, memory controllers, as we design them today, are unlikely to satisfy all of the requirements. Uh, and there are some emerging memory technologies that happen to be non-volatile that enable new opportunities. Uh, and hopefully you read the memory storage merging part. Do you guys remember that? The single level stores or, in general, memory and storage merging. How do we actually rethink the memory and storage system together? I think that's a really good uh, direction of research also. Uh, but basically, given these trends and the requirements, we need to rethink the main memory system to fix the issues we're having with DRAM, which we will talk about soon, and to enable the emerging memory technologies. Because this is, a, this is a, in a sense, a new opportunity, right? This opportunity was not there before uh, for a long time, uh, while satisfying all the requirements, of course. And these requirements are important. So what are actually, uh, let's talk about some of the trends that are affecting main memory. So if you read the paper, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but basically, we need more from memory. Uh, we need more capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service. And this is really driven by three trends. Right? And pl please ask questions when, you, when we get to it, uh, if, you, if you have questions. I can talk on this topic for days and days, if you leave me alone. <laughs> so <laughs> ask questions. But this is really driven by three major things. One is multi-core, or many agents on chip. Right? There are an increasing number of cores and agents that are sharing memory. And this is also not necessarily only cores, but it's also entire system, right? Memory is shared in this thing. Uh, and they demand more capacity, bandwidth, and predictability. Applications are increasingly data intensive. Today, we are dealing with applications that demand more data than ever. Genomics is a very good example, actually. Genomics, the data that you can produce overwhelms the systems that we can build today. Uh, consolidation, and we want to consolidate more. So if you look at cloud computing, for example, people want to put more applications on the same system such that they can get more efficiency out of the system, area efficiency, energy efficiency. And that's true for, for a lot of the systems. So it's good to do some studies. And fortunately, some people uh, did some of these studies. Basically, this is the memory capacity gap. This is a paper from uh, University of Michigan and HP Labs in ISCA 2009. Oh, I used to have the reference here. I don't know what happened. OK, I will put the reference then. <laughs> but uh, basically, it's Kevin Lim, uh, Partha Ranganathan. Uh, I believe Trevor Mudge is also an author in this paper. Basically, what they've shown is core count is doubling approximately every two years, and DRAM DIMM capacity is doubling approximately every three years. As a result, you have this memory capacity gap, right, which is growing between the core counts. So if you do the math, memory capacity per core is expected to drop by 30% every two years. Now, if you're relying on a single thread getting more memory, basically you're not getting it. Right? You're actually getting less memory, assuming you're consolidating on the chip which is a problem because now how do you actually add more features to your single-threaded program? This puts a lot more burden on the programmer. And trends are actually much worse for memory bandwidth per core, so hopefully uh, the GPU paper from NVIDIA will actually convince you that this is a very important problem. Uh, but basically, memory bandwidth is increasing by 10% every year, except for some jumps, like the 3D stacking has actually enabled a little bit more. Uh, but that's uh, some people have referred to that as the uh, dumbbell approach to designing systems. You have this uh, ex extremely uh, compute-intensive CPU and uh, memory, and you're connecting them uh, with a little channel that really bottlenecks the entire system. <laughs> That's basically the bandwidth problem, right? Maybe that connection is not a good connection, good way of designing systems. But trends are actually much worse for memory bandwidth per core. And if you're actually going to do a project in this area, I would actually plot, do, do a plot like this for memory bandwidth. That would be really interesting to see. OK. Can I ask something? That might be yeah. like a stupid remark, but yeah. in your paper, you, you were mentioning how the memory bus is a mm -hmm. single bottleneck. Yeah. But I didn't see any ideas on that particular uh -huh. component in the memory bus. Like I, I saw ideas about improving DRAM capacity, sure. supporting uh, supercritic DRAM, but I didn't see any specific Well, one example is doing computation on the other side, which is not bringing data. For example, if you're doing page copies, row clone, you can think of it as solving that problem also, right? It solves a lot of other problems also, but you don't yeah. use the bandwidth over there, but you use the internal DRAM bandwidth. Yeah, 
So I say you don't. You get the result that you want, but using a different. That's right. Exactly. Which is a so, so we've made it more of a problem, perhaps, by the way we use the systems. That's what uh, the row clone idea is kind of arguing, right? So the, the, there are many. There could be many approaches to this. So I think what you're getting into is how you actually increase the bandwidth of that bus, which is also a very important, right? How do you actually do that with low cost? And that's that's a good problem also. I think one of the ideas sub area level parallelism tries to do that. Not necessarily increase the bus, but better utilize the DRM bandwidth internally. I mean, if you can do that, that's good, actually. And there are some ideas uh, that we can discuss that try to increase the parallelism or bandwidth. Interconnect exactly, interconnect, very good, efficient interconnect technologies uh, actually can enable that, certainly. We didn't discuss that that much, but there are a lot of, uh, there's a big solution space, certainly. But I think uh, that's actually a difficult problem. It's uh, Certainly you can investigate that and people should investigate that, but if you can actually uh, design the system such that there is no single big bottleneck <coughs> anywhere, that would probably be a good solution. That way you can scale all, all of the components at the same rate instead of trying to solve this problem that, become, that has become really difficult. Okay, okay. so the other uh, uh, big uh, trend affecting main memory is energy and power is a key system design concern today. Actually, this is another paper that I would recommend. It's by Charles Leferci et al. I think it's called uh, Energy Consumption in Servers or something like that. Basically, it's, it's too late for me to remember the reference names it's <laughs> right now. Uh, but uh, I triple computer 2003. They have examined the energy consumption of big iron systems at IBM. These are really huge systems. And they've shown that approximately 40 to 50 percent of the entire system energy is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. Now, this includes off-chip interconnect, off-chip DRAM, off-chip storage, off-chip caches. Uh, and this is actually a nice paper to read. And one of the issues is DRAM consumes power even when it's not used. And this is the refresh problem that you read about. You need to periodically refresh it. And this is going to become even worse going into the future. Uh, and I'll talk about some other papers from Samsung and Intel that actually talk about refresh being one of the big scaling limiters in DRAM. And the third issue is DRAM technology scaling is ending. And I think we have more evidence for it. Uh, going forward, which we will talk about. Basically, ITRS uh, publishes a report, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, publishes a yearly report on the scaling issues in technology. And they've been projecting for a long time that DRAM will not scale easily below X nanometers. Of course, they assign a value to X every year, and that value gets <laughs> start, keeps reducing. But it's clear that as you push X down, uh, it it's, it's becomes more difficult to uh, scale DRAM. Uh, well, it becomes more difficult to actually maintain the properties that we want from DRAM. And scaling is actually, scaling means basically you reduce the size of the circuit, right? That's, that's the way I use it over here. It's not like you build many, many servers. That's another way of scaling. It's really technology scaling. You reduce the size of the circuit uh, with which you build memory. It enables higher capacity, lower cost, and reasonable energy, hopefully. And if this is not happening anymore, at least reliably, then this is actually threatening a lot of this over here. At least with DRAM as the memory technology. So that's why I think all of these are really interrelated. Because if the scaling is ending, energy and power will become a bigger problem. Refresh will become a bigger problem. And ca if capacity and bandwidth is, are not scaling, all of this will become a bigger problem. So hopefully the problem is clear. And the GPU paper will provide more evidence to it from the industry perspective. Uh, so what is this DRAM scaling problem? Uh, basically, if you look at DRAM, this is, uh, how many of you have taken circuits courses? So you know what the circuit is, hopefully. It's pretty simple. But basically, uh, in any memory device, you need a storage device and an access device. Any memory you build. This is really important, actually. Access device is also called selector device in some domains. But the storage device in DRAM is the capacitor. You just need that, actually. But if you not want to be able to access that, you need this access device, which consists of the access transistor and the sense amplifiers that uh, sense the charge that's shared by this capacitor when this transistor is turned on, right? So for this circuit to work, this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, first of all. And this access transistor must be large enough for low leakage, right, through this RC path and high retention time. The problem is as you reduce the size of the circuit uh, in different dimensions, uh, it becomes more challenging to maintain both of these properties. And this was actually, if you're curious, this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2009. In 2009, they said 
reducing the size, the feature size below 35 nanometers is challenging. Now they said challenging. It's clear it's challenging. What do you think uh, the size, the feature size of modern DRAMs are? Yeah, it's around 20 actually today. Yeah. But it's going down certainly. Certainly companies are pushing it down. So it's clearly we've scaled it beyond, but it's come at a cost. And the cost you read already, right? Uh, which is uh, one, at least one evidence of the cost. There may be other costs that we don't know of, which, which is, by the way, it's a, it's a really interesting area to, to figure out what are the failure mechanisms in modern DRAMs going forward. So yes? Yeah. Like the hammer where if you were to take the, the paper, right? Yeah. But like the strong surgical companies like these, and I'll agree that that error will become much more prevalent, right? Wh which kind of errors? This kind of? Errors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll talk about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll recommend a paper. So industry is now proposing in DRAM ECC error correction codes, which was a big no-no for a long time. Well, uh, right now there is, as far as we know, there is nothing. Yes, but in, in the future that may change. Yes. In common applications, yeah. There, there is no published research okay. in that, but anecdotally, it happens in some applications. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I'll, I'll talk about that actually. I'll, I'll recommend that that Google blog also. I don't want to add the, add all of these to your review papers, but there are a lot of exciting papers to read. <laughs> but there's only so much time, right? But I mean, you, you've already read the paper, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. So this is one evidence of the DRAM scaling problem. Basically, it's the read disturb errors that are getting exposed to the user. Right? Read disturbance means basically if you activate a row in DRAM and if you precharge it, basically apply high voltage to the word line and then low voltage to the word line, and keep doing this over and over enough times, in many modern DRAMs you see these errors that are appearing on adjacent rows. Yes. Yeah, you should, you should read that paper. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it looks at whether or not it's associated with the weak rows or not. It doesn't look like that's the case. So this is happening, uh, you need to do this enough times within a refresh interval. So this is happening within the refresh interval, 64 milliseconds. So you basically hammer the row, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge enough times within the refresh interval before the adjacent rows get refreshed. Not necessarily, actually, because what happens is, uh, by doing this enough times, you accelerate the charge leakage. It may be the weakest rows, but it's, that doesn't seem to be the case. Some, it's not clear if we know the exact mechanics of what's happening. Yeah, yeah I mean, your, 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 your hypothesis is good, actually. The paper tests that hypothesis, if you look at one of the sections. Take a look at the paper. <laughs> you have a good hypothesis, but that's not necessarily uh, what we found in experiments, at least. That's right. That's right. That, that's, still put on the that's right. It's not clear what kind of cells, though. They, they haven't tested it. Maybe Jeremy can <laughs> talk about it later. <laughs> okay, let me, let me move on. But I think that's basically you have some hypothesis. Are these happening to rows that have less charge uh, to begin with? May or may not. Because what's happening is really here, uh, you have this disturbance. And it's not, only, it's not only about the charge that exists in the cells, but it's also about how much disturbance that you can cause to that. If you cannot cause enough disturbance, so if you can cause enough disturbance because of some variation effects here in the circuit to a very strong cell, maybe you can drain that cell if you do this enough times, right? Basically, what you're doing is really exciting charge leakage in the adjacent rows. That's my explanation. <laughs> Again, it's very difficult to prove everything without knowing the exact circuits. OK, so this is the hammer draw. These are the victim rows. And this is very fundamental, as I said, in memory. All memory will have this effect. If you design some magic memory, if, you have, if it's electrical, you will, have this pro you will run into this problem eventually as you scale the circuit down. 
and hard disks have this also, by the way, but we can, we can ignore that for now. But basically, the, the scary thing in DRAM is uh, this happens in the chips that you can buy today. As a result, it gets exposed to the user because most DRAM today doesn't have error correction, right? It doesn't have a way of handling it. Yes? I see. So it's not clear, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the exact circuit mechanisms, it's really, you can read the paper. There are several hypotheses, but it's very difficult to prove exactly what it is. And it's probably a combination of mechanisms, actually, okay. according to manufacturers. It's probably a combination of mechanisms that exacerbate the problem. So we'll talk about actually read disturb errors in Flash. You should take a look at the paper. There, the mechanisms are better known. So in Flash, what happens is when you, when you program a word line, uh, you apply some, uh, well, when you read, when you read uh, a word line, when you read a row, let's say, you apply some voltage to it. But you, also, you apply a higher uh, voltage to other word lines uh, in, the same, uh, in the same block. And as a result, if you keep reading from the same block, the pages get disturbed because you're actually applying high voltages. We'll talk about that, and you should read the paper. So there, the mechanisms are a little bit better known. But here, internals of DRAM are a little bit harder to but I think this is an, it sounds like an interesting problem where some of you should do projects on. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it attracts some attention. Okay, but so uh, if you look at DRAM, it's not protected, it's directly exposed. So this kind of error gets directly exposed to the processor, right, and the program in the end. So if you read this paper, which I have not assigned as a review paper yet, maybe we'll do it later. I wanted to focus on GPUs first. Uh, most of the chips that are tested from different manufacturers exhibit this error, more than 80%. And you can read the paper for the exact details. Now, you can actually expose these errors with a user-level program that looks like this. And you can actually download this program. And Google has a better version of this program, apparently. Uh, but basically, it's a seven-line program. What it does is, it basically does this, right? It ping-pongs between two rows. Uh, in the same bank, so you need to select the addresses appropriately, of course, to cause this, which means that you need to do some reverse engineering or you need to be lucky, such that the things go to the same bank. And you need to circumvent the caches, of course, to ensure that you're accessing memory. As a result, you can cause errors. Uh, and this is, again, from the paper, basically. The real systems are vulnerable, and the vulnerability, the errors, or the rate of errors, depends on the access rate. And it's not a linear relationship. Uh, basically, you need to be able to leak the charge out of the adjacent cells fast enough before they're refreshed. Right? So you need to be able to access memory fast enough. That's why, maybe I should be doing this since you're, it's recorded over here. So that's why the systems that have higher access rates to memory see more errors. Okay. And why is this a scaling problem? So it's, it's a scaling problem because older chips don't have this problem, actually. So DI manufacturers were somehow able to not expose it. But it started appearing recently, and all of the chips that were tested in this paper between 2012 and 2013 were vulnerable. They exhibited this problem. Basically, somehow, it slipped into the field, right? Uh, and that, I mean, that you can hypothesize why, is that, why that happened. And it could be hard to test for these errors, right? Testing is a problem, actually. Testing is a problem on any chip today. As you scale down the technology, you've got to ensure that it works. And it's becoming more difficult uh, in DRAM also. So it's, not, it's no big surprise. And uh, so these are the experimental infrastructures that my students have developed to test. So I if you're interested in this problem, I would recommend reading some of the other related papers. And these slides will be available. Uh, and actually, uh, if you want to do a project related to DRAM, you can use this infrastructure too. So it's good to think about potential projects related to this. What else can I do with an infrastructure FPGA-based infrastructure that can actually test DRAM. Uh, this is where you can exercise your creativity. If you have a failure mode in mind, think about it. OK, then this is the newer version. And we can actually uh, help build uh, even bigger infrastructures. So basically, you should, you should take a look at the paper. But one question is, how do you solve the problem, right? That's, uh, what do you guys think? Have you thought about solutions? Some of you already read the paper from 1247. So. <laughs> So one, one immediate solution is, why don't you increase the refresh rate, right? And that's actually what 
some manufacturers have done. Uh, if you look at Apple, Apple has a security update recently where they say they increase the refresh rate uh, to actually fix this problem. Uh, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> I mean, it's a good idea if you want to prevent errors, of course. It's, uh, if, if you have no choice, it's good, but it's probably not a good, good solution in the long run because refresh rate is already a problem, becoming a problem, and increasing it causes uh, more energy and more performance impact. Uh, another solution is someone suggest ECC, right? Actually, this is a solution that DRAM manufacturers are following, in my opinion, not only for this problem, but also other problems, like retention issues. They can be sold. If you have really weak growth, <coughs> if you have ECC, you can actually handle the errors caused by those weak growths, and then you don't need to refresh DRAM as much. So if you think about it, uh, you have this spectrum, uh, you have this continuum. You can have no refresh in DRAM, but lots of error correction. And you can have uh, lots of refresh and not, no error correction. So the key is how do you actually balance in that continuum, yes? Uh, error correction codes, well, uh, depends, right? Depends on how, what's your granularity of correction, what is the code word, if you will, and how many bits you want to correct. So for example, if you look at ECC DIMMs today, which is uh, you have an, another chip uh, to do the correction. Basically, you can correct single bit errors in a cache line. Uh, the, air, uh, the overhead is 12.5% today. You have an ad additional chip, yeah. Yeah, it's basically pretty high. Right? And uh, I'll recommend this paper in a little bit from Samsung and Intel. They talk about some of the overheads of doing it in DRAM as well. But the manufacturers are right now considering doing ECC within DRAM, uh, within the chip itself. So that's one other solution. Another solution could be selectively refreshing, right? Uh, and the paper talks about that solution. Yes? Can you have another paper for variable refresh rate? Like that's right, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. You might do have the physical address to know where the, the memory uh, mm -hmm. happens, so you might refresh that cache. That's right, exactly. If you can somehow figure that out, that's, a, that's one potential solution. Then the key question is how do you track those physical addresses at low cost? I would recommend reading the paper for the solution space. It talks about the solution space. But I think one scary thing about a lot of these scaling issues is one can actually take over the entire system that's otherwise secure, right? Otherwise, you can do, have perfect security. But if you have this little bug in your system, somebody can take over. And uh, some of you read the paper, but the, the paper starts, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored on other addresses. In a sense, that's where the secure systems are built. But I would recommend this uh, blog from Google that actually exactly uh, tried to exploit this fact, the fact that you can actually change another address by just reading an address. Right? Uh, and it's a nice blog. Uh, you can, this is actually directly from, copied from uh, that blog. They say they test the selection of laptops and found that a subset of them exhibit the problem. And they, ex they built two working privilege ex escalation exploits. And you can read that. And how they did it is pretty interesting, actually. Uh, basically, uh, what they did was, and they explained this in a little bit detail. I don't think they have the source code of this yet. Do they? <laughs> Probably they didn't put it up. But basically, uh, a process was able to uh, induce bit flips in its page table entries. And you know how the page table is structured. And if you know which bits are vulnerable, to this row hammer problem, you can induce uh, errors in the write enable bits to a page table entry that actually points to your own page table. Now you can get write access to your own page table. Right. And you can take a look at the explanation over here. Basically, you can get write access to your own page table. And once you have write access to your own page table, that's good, right? You can write to the entire physical memory. That's the nice thing. Well, that's the dangerous thing of not having memory isolation, actually. Isolation is one of the fundamental principles of security. You've got to isolate things so that one thing doesn't affect the other thing, right? If two things are not supposed to affect each other, that isolation. And this is really breaking the memory isolation. And it was clear that somebody would exploit it, and somebody did exploit it. So this was the DM Robhammer vulnerability. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I found this on the web somewhere. But I think actually one, one nice analogy that someone put on the web related to this was, let's say you want to gain access to that door over here. You keep banging on this door, and because you bang it enough times within an interval, that door opens. And that's kind of the problem. 
that we have over here, right? So that's kind of a nice analogy, I think. Someone was creative enough to come up with that. <laughs> okay, so let's recap. And I'm going to recommend this paper uh, from Samsung and Intel. It's in the Memory Forum 2014. It's a very short paper. Uh, it's written from the industry perspective. And normally, Samsung and Intel don't write papers together. So you should treat this as a valuable resource, if you will. <laughs> and this may be the only paper Samsung and Intel has written together. It's amazing. <laughs> and it's called Co-Architecting Controllers and DRAM to Enhance DRAM Process Scaling. It's written by a DRAM design team and as well as uh, Intel memory controller and DRAM teams together. But basically, this paper talks about some process scaling challenges. Of course, it doesn't have a whole lot of data because they, don't, uh, they cannot talk about that data. But they identify three major challenges in DRAM scaling. One is refresh. Basically, basically what I said earlier, it's difficult to build. The leakage current of cell access transfer is increasing and uh, cell capacity is decreasing. As a result, you have this escape problem. And it's not clear today to me that some of the errors we're, not, we're seeing in the <coughs> field in DRAM uh, are not refresh errors. So it may be because, so testing this is difficult, right? How do you actually determine the minimum refresh rate uh, for your DRAM? You need to actually test all of the cells in DRAM and ensure that they actually retain data for 64 milliseconds under all operating conditions. And this becomes difficult in the presence of this thing over here, VRT variable retention time. It turns out a cell doesn't have a stable retention time over entire its lifetime. Basically, it jumps between multiple retention time states. And sometimes it may retain data for seconds. But then at some point, charge gets trapped in the cell, and you get uh, really fast leakage. It's called uh, trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage. And as a result, your retention time tanks goes down to, let's say, 8 milliseconds. Now the key question is, how do you test DRAM such that you actually get to the period where the cell has that 8 millisecond retention time interval? It turns out to be, this, uh, this is actually a random process, not a predictable process, based on the experiments we've done and other people have done. So that's why refresh is a really hard problem in the presence of this VRT. You need to test DRAM long enough to get to the minimum retention time of every single cell to guarantee correct operation every 64 milliseconds. That's why I think going forward, DRAM, we, we should not think of DRAM as a perfect memory. For, for, for a long time, we've thought about DRAM as perfect memory, right? We don't have error correction. We don't have anything to fix the issues that we may see. And we only thought soft errors are possible. But I think a lot of the errors that we may see going into the future are, could be retention errors, because we weren't able to test DRAM well enough. As a result, we weren't able to determine the retention time well enough, right? So these, uh, the paper actually makes a case for NDRAM ECC to, I mean, they don't directly say it, but they argue uh, for having NDRAM ECC error correction codes such that a lot of these things can ease, right? Well, actually, the, these two can ease. If you have some ECC, now you're relaxing, actually. You're making life a little bit easier on the uh, DRAM manufacturer as well as the system. But I think there are a lot of system trade-offs to examine here. Is DRAM the right place to put this ECC on, maybe? That makes DRAM manufacturers' life certainly easier when testing, right? Well, they don't need to, uh, they, they can do some error correction internally. But do you have ECC in the system? Can you actually, do you actually even have to have ECC in the system? Can you actually make things work with unreliable memory, right? That's actually a good uh, way of thinking also. Uh, we'll talk about some of the solution directions very soon. But. And the third thing they discuss is the uh, write latency. Uh, I think this is less of a fundamental problem, but uh, it's important also. Write latency is increasing because you have more contact resistance as you reduce the uh, size of the capacitor and access transistor. But take a look at this paper. It's, it's definitely good. I didn't assign it, but maybe you want me to assign it? <laughs> OK. I mean, I'll recommend a lot of papers, so we're not, uh, not all of them will be assigned clearly. So the key question is, how do we solve the problem? Now, I, I posed everything as a DRAM scaling problem, but it's bigger than that, clearly, right? We want more mem bigger memories. Even if DRAM is scaling, we want more memory bandwidth. So how do we solve it? Uh, basically, I think one solution direction is making DRAM and controllers more intelligent, and you've seen that uh, in the paper. And this is, I think, inevitable. This is kind of what this paper also argues for, right? Making co-architecting controllers and DRAM together. And this means we should be looking at new interfaces, new functions, new architectures. And I call this the system DRAM co-design. Again, if, you if you're having a scaling problem at the bottom layers, 
punt it to the higher layers. <laughs> if you cannot design a single core system very well, well, design a multi-core system and declare it someone else's problem. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that here. That's kind of a cynical view, of course. Not declare it someone else's problem, but ensure that you add enough things that the system programmer can take advantage of that multi-core system. That's a, another way of scaling the system, right? Uh, basically here, if the circuit is not scaling very well, maybe you should actually have the right interfaces such that the higher level, the entire system scales together. And this is a very fundamental thing, I think. It's not just DRAM. Flash memory has this. Any kind of memory has this. Any kind of scaling issue that you see in technology, you can solve it by going to the higher level and designing the higher level together with the lower level. I think it's a very fundamental principle. I don't know what to call it. Cross-layer design, maybe. <laughs> OK. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and the paper talked a lot about that. And I think given this trend, actually, in-memory computation becomes really interesting because people are already designing new interfaces, thinking about new interfaces to memory. Like 3D stack technology is a very new interface to access memory, right? You have the true silicon vias, or you have chip-to-chip -chip bonding. Now the question is, once you have these new interfaces, maybe you can have a totally different system design where you do in-memory computation. So we'll talk about that too. But the second solution direction uh, is eliminating or minimizing this problem, right? If you can do it, that's also good perhaps, right? If you have a different technology that doesn't have all of these problems, why not move to it, right? If you can somehow do it. But you probably need to uh, design mechanisms to do this, basically. This can lead to system-wide rethinking. And you need to have the right technologies. And today, there are a lot of technologies, like, like what you read. Phase change memory is one. Uh, STT MRAM is another. Memristors is another. I have, and we'll probably assign papers at some point. And you can do projects on this area also. Uh, but this is an exciting topic also. And at some point, if the technology is good enough and you can enable it, then that can totally replace. This is actually. Uh, this, this, this can actually cause disruption in the entire system, right? You have a new technology. And now DRAM is out of the system. If that's possible, that's good. And this is good to do research. And the third direction, and actually this is very, a little bit philosophical, but people have always looked for universal memory. Uh, if you search for universal memory, you'll find things uh, like STTM RAM. Is STTM RAM the universal memory? Universal memory meaning it's good at everything. <laughs> I don't believe there's such thing <laughs> at this point, given that. Uh, 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 I think uh, different memories have different upsides and downsides. So that's why this third solution direction is also very interesting. Basically, somehow I've designed the system more to be more heterogeneous. Right? It's very similar to do you design a system with a lot of sing small cores or a lot of big cores? Well, why don't be heterogeneous? Because there's no one size fits all. Again, there's no one size fits all because there's no technology that's good at everything. So why not actually design heterogeneous memories? And some of which may not be perfect, right? <coughs> Uh, you may have very unreliable DRAM, yet if you're intelligent about how to use that unreliable DRAM, you can actually take advantage of it, right? So this, this can actually new, lead to new models for data management and maybe usage. So all of these different directions are actually good project topics, and maybe you can think about other things over here. So I think what's clear, and th that's what the paper uh, was written towards also, Whatever solution you come up with, I think you'll need this sort of so software, hardware, and device cooperation because the device is not scaling very well. So you'll need to rethink uh, a lot of things in the system. For example, uh, I think emerging technologies are pretty exciting because they actually may change how we think about algorithms, right? So if you have persistence everywhere, let's say, how do you design the algorithms? Uh, that becomes really interesting, I think. Or if you have some memories that are unreliable, how do you design maybe the algorithms how to take advantage of unreliable memories, right? OK. Any questions? You guys have been asking questions, but is it getting late, or am I get going over time? Not yet. I'm not going to finish this talk, definitely. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the solution directions a little bit. I think there are three broad solution directions. One is fixing DRAM. How do you do that? Well, system DRAM co-design, new DRAM architectures, interfaces, and functions. And industry is actually moving towards this direction. That paper is a good example of it. Uh, better waste management is important also. I think there are several key issues to tackle. Reliability is critical. Energy is also very important. You will see that actually in the NVIDIA paper. Improving latency and bandwidth, they're important. Basically, I think we need to fix everything <laughs> in DRAM. Uh, reducing waste, and we're wasting a lot. It's, it's always good to think about 
we have this technology that's not scaling, are we actually wasting it? And if you actually look at memory, we're wasting a lot of latency, for example, because timing parameters are, uh, uh, are actually very conservative. Right? And I'll, I'll probably talk about a paper related to that. But if you look at it, we'll need to uh, improve a lot of this. And enabling computation close to data can actually help a lot of these. That was the point of the talk uh, that, you, uh, that you listened to and found really fast. So hopefully I'm not talking that fast here. <laughs> At only 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, but I think enabling computation close to data can actually reduce energy because you don't need to. One of the big energy consumers is really that interconnect between memory and processor, and you'll see that again in the NVIDIA paper. Uh, uh, it can improve both latency and bandwidth because now you have access to this huge bandwidth in memory, right? Internally in memory. And if you have that, maybe you can actually have intelligent management. So you can actually improve the reliability. If you have a processor or an intelligent memory controller underneath the DRAM that's monitoring DRAM, then you can actually have enable reliability maybe at low cost. The low cost is always difficult because if you have 3D stacking, that actually increases your cost also, right? And that actually causes some other problems. Nothing comes for free because if you have a processor sitting underneath DRAM now, where does the heat go? Right. That's an in interesting problem. Okay, let's look at the emerging memory technology. That's the second direction. Uh, I'm going to cover this very briefly, but basically the exciting part over here is there are some emerging resistive memory technologies that seem more scalable than DRAM. And they also have some, the added benefit that they're non-volatile. Now I think this is really exciting because they can enable new opportunities in the system. One example is phase change memory. Uh, and I don't know how many of you heard this 3D X point announcement from, oh okay. I guess it was able to reach a lot of people. Basically, Intel and Micron announced their new fancy memory technology, which they didn't give any details on. <laughs> it's called 3D X Point. And a lot of people speculate that it's based on phase change memory, uh, based on their previous works, of course. It's not clear. We don't know. We don't know if it's even real. <laughs> Maybe real. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, but basically, uh, these technologies are real, though. They exist. People have been testing them. And phase change memory, at the same time ITRS said it's difficult to scale DRAM below 35 nanometers, they were saying phase change memory is scalable to 9 nanometers. And IBM actually prototyped that at 20 nanometers in 2008. So it's a very scalable technology. And we'll talk about why it's scalable, because it's resistive, actually. You're not relying on charge. Uh, it's expected to be denser than DRAM because you can actually store multiple bits per cell. You can chop up the resistance range into multiple bits. The problem is a lot of these technologies, and uh, there's MRAM, magnetic memory, and there's also uh, memristors, RRAM, resistor RAM. The problem is these emerging technologies have many, many shortcomings as well. The key question is can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, or surpass DRAM? It's actually a good direction also. Uh, and I would recommend actually this paper. I didn't assign it this time because I didn't want to overload you, but this is uh, one of the first papers in the area, uh, architecting phase change memory as a scalable DRAM alternative. Uh, uh, and you can take a look at that. Uh, it basically, we examined uh, uh, the state of the art at that point in phase change memory and looked at how can you actually use the technology that we have today for phase change memory just to replace DRAM. And what are the implications on uh, not the system, but just performance and energy. We didn't look at the persistence characteristics. It's just performance and energy uh, and endurance, of course. One of the problems with these technologies, well, some of them in phase change memory, for example, as you write to a cell, uh, you degrade the contacts. As a result, at some point, you're not able to read from the cell. It's called the wear out problem. You wear out the cell. Flash memory has this, and it's becoming a bigger problem in flash memory going forward. But these technologies also have it. So if you have memory that has this wear out problem, how do you actually make it work? Right? That's actually really interesting, I think. And one of the interesting questions is does DRAM have the wear out problem? People actually have thought DRAM doesn't have the wear out problem, but that's even, even for that, I think jury is out when the DRAM technology becomes smaller and smaller. Okay, so I think the third solution direction, which, in, which is uh, pro very promising, is building hybrid memory systems that look like this. Basically, if you cannot design a single technology that's good at everything, why not design multiple technologies and put them together somehow? And this is just one example. This is, it doesn't have to be like this, right? You can have a single memory channel connecting to a DIMM that contains multiple technologies together and somehow somebody manages it. But the key is here, you somehow design the hardware and the software to manage data allocation and movement to achieve the best of multiple technologies. 
greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. I think this is at the high level heterogeneity idea is actually very fundamental, right? You basically, this enables the scaling of the system without relying on single technology. Now, of course, the downside with any kind of heterogeneous system is complexity, right? Now, some, somebody needs to bear that complexity and, and you need to have good mechanisms to take advantage of it. But this is already happening, actually, if you look at the systems today. You, you, you already have very high bandwidth DRAM as well as high capacity DRAM, right? 3D stack DRAM. Uh, actually, people have DRAM caches right now. Uh, uh, IBM has lots of DRAM caches, and they're based on eDRAM technology, embedded DRAM technology. And then you have the commodity DRAM as your main memory. So you already have this bifurcation and memory system, and it's going to increase going forward. As you have technology scaling problems, this bifurcation increase. And then maybe there's, you can think of this as going back to Kuhn's scientific revolutions. It's kind of a little application of it. You have no consensus in the field. You have all these memory technologies that are proliferating, and you're using them in the best ways. And then some technology comes and, oh, it's good at, at least reasonable at everything, and then it replaces all of the heterogeneous memories. Maybe it'll happen. I don't know. But it's always good to think about. OK. So one example I will give, uh, to just to exercise your thought, uh, is uh, basically if you can have uh, error tolerance in applications, can you somehow exploit it using hybrid memory systems? And I'm going to refer you to the paper, but this is just a cartoonish picture. You can have different kinds of data in an application, and it can be vulnerable to different extents to memory errors. So if you get a single bit flip, maybe you don't care in this part of the data, a, bit, a pixel changes on the screen. Who cares, right, maybe. But a pointer changes such that you get a seg fault. Well, maybe you care about that pointer a lot, right? So if you can somehow classify your data in terms of its vulnerability, and I think that's an open problem, actually, you can perhaps map your data to different kinds of memories, which you can construct in different ways. Uh, and now you can have a heterogeneous reliability memory. And you can actually look at this paper. This is Yishin Luo's paper in DSN. Uh, we'll link it. And it's also a reference from that pa uh, paper, actually, that you read. But you can actually uh, scale the systems much better. For example, the case study in this uh, paper was Microsoft's web search workload. Uh, and uh, if you look at the data centers that big companies build, they usually buy ECC memory. So everything has ECC memory in the data centers because they cannot afford those. Uh, faults as much as you can afford in your laptop. I guess the assumption is that you can afford it in your laptop, right? That's, but the data centers have ECC. So one of the concerns for those companies is how can we reduce the cost? So if you look at the data center, memory cost is actually a big cost. You, this paper talks about that. So if you can reduce the ECC somehow, you can actually reduce the cost significantly. Yes? Uh, are you aware of George applying this idea uh, to mixed criticality systems? Uh, what, what do you mean by mixed criticality? Yes. Uh -huh. So I think that's an OS problem that is one to one, but we actually think that it could have a DRL DRL. Yeah, n I, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, actually, it could be. That's right. Yeah. So, so the question is, are there any, because I was looking I for see. it, and I found only one paper doing that, like the application was. Doing, basically using uh, different memories. Also apply, mm -hmm. So all the mathematicians mm -hmm. applied an, uh, an OS model to unit processors, mm -hmm. making assumptions that you cannot reduce the hardware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right now, from all the works I've read, uh, I found this one paper trying to do that kind of the mapping on. on I see. Here. Oh, that's that's interesting. What, can you send me that paper? Oh, yeah. be I, because I'm not aware of any work that did it in memory. Because I was trying uh -huh. to find that for dynamic system mm -hmm. uh, scheduling, and mm -hmm. nobody was doing that for uh, multi core. Okay. And I realized that it's super difficult to map it. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it could be a good idea. I know that there are some works that look at critical data, non-critical data, and they mark it at the program level, and they reduce the refresh rate for kind of non-critical data. But it's different from what you say, I think, the mixed criticality. But the, the mixed criticality. So that's maybe yeah. even easier, because we know beforehand yeah. which are the critical. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, the, the reference, I'll, I mean, send me, send me an email for the paper, but the reference that I talked about is called Flickr. I think it was published in ASPOS 2011 from Microsoft Research. Yeah, yeah if you just search for Flickr, F-L-I-K-K-E-R, it talks about this idea. Somehow partitioning your data is critical and non-critical, and for non-critical stuff, you don't need to refresh as much. But how do you build this low-cost memory is interesting. Basically, uh, uh, what we did in this study was uh, Yishin looked at the work web search workload, and he showed that you can actually reduce the server hardware cost by 4.7%, with some assumptions, of course. You can need to read the paper. Uh, while still achieving single server availability target of 99.9%. That's pretty good, assuming you have, you reduced the hardware costs, you've gotten rid of ECC in some of your memory space. So I think going forward, this kind of solutions are really interesting, actually. This paper just scratches the surface, in my opinion. How do you actually do that in better ways? How do you do that in more automated ways is really interesting, because there's a lot that goes on here, right? How do you actually designate your vulnerable, non-vulnerable data? Who does it? How do you actually do the mapping? What kind of memories actually do you design? It's a huge design space, right? It's application specific also, right? You, you clearly need to know about your application to be able to do this. Okay, so there's this orthogonal issue that I uh, also talk about uh, in the paper. So hopefully we'll, we'll be done in 10 minutes, but we're not gonna cover the entire talk. But this orthogonal issue is actually really important uh, too. And that's the issue of this being a bottleneck but it's not only a bottleneck, but it's as well as a shared resource, right? And it's not only this, but there are a lot of other shared resources. But when you're accessing chain me main memory, regardless of how you build this memory, you have this quality of service problem. Cores interfere with each other. And the problem has been for a long time, memory interference between cores has been uncontrolled. Memory interference in the main memory. Uh, also in caches, right? When, when people first designed shared caches, there was no control. One core could actually be streaming and it would kick out the data of another core. Now Intel actually has mechanisms in Haswell to actually control it. Going forward, there will be mechanisms in the memory controller, there will be mechanisms in the entire system because people will see that this is a big problem in terms of scaling, right? And Intel has been looking at that. And I believe so other companies will have that mechanism. So, so this is becoming better. But the problem is if you don't have, if you cannot control the interference, you can have unfair system, you can starve some application, you can have low performance, right? Because one application streams through the cache, it doesn't even benefit from the cache, but the, makes the cache useless for everybody else because it kicks out the data for other applications, right? Same is true for the memory system, right? One application actually is a bandwidth hog, as a result, it denies service to others. As a result, you get an uncontrollable, unpredictable, and vulnerable system, right? So if you have this shared resource, how do you control it? The solution direction is, if, as you read, it's quality of service aware memory systems. And again, this needs to be somehow hardware software cooperative, right? You need to design the hardware, you need to have the mechanisms in hardware such that you can do fair scheduling or fair, you can implement some fairness substrate. And uh, the, you've already read about this, but we'll, we'll cover this later on also. Uh, how do you do memory scheduling? How do you do memory partitioning? How do you do throttling in a fair way? Once you have these mechanisms, the software can actually uh, configure these mechanisms to achieve different quality of service goals. And there may be different quality of service goals, right? Maybe you don't care about quality of service, that could be one goal. But another goal could be, oh, this application has to finish within a deadline, right? And people have been looking at this in real-time systems for a long time, certainly. Uh, but in multi-core systems, maybe there are soft deadlines depending on how you use it, right? If you have, for example, a data center, if you want to consolidate applications, some of which have requirements in terms of service levels, you need to provide some sort of guarantee. Yeah. Regarding partition and throttling and yeah. or share sharing of resource, could they be, could we be inspired by protocols that have been developed for networks? Such as mm -hmm. the network link could, and the way they manage congestion in networks mm -hmm. be, uh, could be analogous to what can yeah. network firms do? Yeah, ab absolutely, yeah. There, there are a lot of similarities, I think. And, uh, and how, how protocols mm -hmm. that, are, that are successful in managing the congestion mm -hmm. It's applicable, but you need to take into account the unique properties of the on-chip system. So it's definitely, you can, you can. So uh, actually, I will recommend one paper, the Stall Time Fair Memory Scheduling paper uh, that we did in Micro in 2007. We did exactly that. So uh, there's network fair queuing. People have looked at fair queuing for a long time, right? That, and they've developed many, many mechanisms for fair queuing. Uh, those are good for single links where you don't have locality and also you don't have a lot of parallelism. So if you look at the DRAM system, 
you have robo for locality and bank level parallelism. So you need to take that into account if you want to design a mechanism that does better than the networks. So network, uh, I think getting inspiration from those other domains is good, but you need to take into account the properties of the shared resource that you're dealing with to do better than that. So that paper I would recommend because it directly talks about this problem. It's called, it's called stall time fair memory scheduling in micro 2007. And we'll at some point be reading it, I think. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, definitely talk with me. There, there's a lot, there are a lot of projects, project topics in this area. I can guide you in the right ways. This is actually a really important problem. I think people, people, are, people are going to realize it even more going forward. Uh, okay. Basically, and why, why is it becoming even more important? Because of this, right? Systems are becoming e more complex. Right? And this is actually, this doesn't even show the complexity of a system like this, I think, and they're becoming on chip. But basically, you have all these different agents, uh, shared caches at different levels, uh, DRAM and hybrid memory controllers going forward, DRAM and hybrid memories. You have heterogeneous agents and heterogeneous memories. Then the key question is, how do you actually allocate the resources to these heterogeneous agents to mitigate the interference and provide predictable performance? That's the problem statement at the high level. And I think having mechanisms for this is really important. Uh, one good direction that I like uh, is, I think uh, strong memory service guarantees are really interesting. How do you actually provide some strong guarantee in terms of latency, bandwidth, or performance? Uh, one approach, it's not the only approach, but I think a, a, a really interesting approach is somehow develop models to accurately estimate the performance loss of an application when it's running together with other applications. So you add the monitoring mechanisms such that you estimate the performance loss that you get online. And if you can do this accurately, that's great, right? Now you can actually say, oh, I'm slowed down by 20% because somebody else is interfering with me. And if you can do this compared to a reference system, that's even better. Let's say, I'm compared to this machine that uh, if I were running alone on this machine, I would be running 25% faster. If you have that information, now you can actually try to achieve a bound, right? Slow down bound. Uh, and how do you achieve that bound? Now you need to have the mechanisms for resource partitioning and prioritization such that you get, achieve that slow down bound. And this is actually not an easy problem uh, because it's not an easy problem when you want high system performance, right? When you have a lot of applications sharing the system. Otherwise, quality of service is not a problem if you actually have one application running alone all the time, right? That's, and you guarantee resources for it. Okay. So I think the solution direction, this is also referenced in the paper, but uh, uh, my student Lavanya actually has done a lot of work in this area. Her thesis was on this area, but there's, there are a, lot, there's a lot more to be done in this area, actually. So if you, if you want to do projects in this area, definitely talk with me. It's something dear to my heart, that memory <laughs> quality of service problem. Okay, so I think I'll leave you at this point because we're almost out of time. But basically, maybe we'll start from here, maybe we'll start from something else. But I think there are three major solution directions that we were, I was going to talk about if we had the time. New memory architectures, rethinking DRAM, and as you will see, rethinking flash memory is also important. Uh, and enab enabling emerging non-volatile memory technologies, there are a lot of interesting directions here. And system level memory and storage quality of service. Actually, quality of service is just bigger than memory also, right? Because your quality of service really depends on your weakest link in the system. If your memory provides quality of service very, good, very well, but if your storage doesn't provide it, then you have a problem. Right? So it's really a system level problem. How do you actually solve it in the entire system is important. But I think we have a lot of hope in all of these, and hopefully you'll, you guys will do some projects in these areas. I think we have a lot of hope in fixing DRAM. We have a lot of hope in enabling emerging memory technologies, depending on how, well, maybe and new interfaces to them, new ways of using them. And I think a lot of hope in designing a predictable system. So in, in research, it's really important to have that hope. Be very positive. <laughs> if you don't have that hope, if you don't believe in what you're doing, then it's going, if you don't believe in it, who will believe in it, right? <laughs> you should believe in it first to make it happen. <laughs> because there will be a lot of other naysayers that will not believe in it. <laughs> okay, that's all I have for today.
Any questions? Comments? Okay, I guess we have a lecture tomorrow and you know your assignments. These will be posted soon. I'll see you next week. And I won't